some things we do on Erev Shavuot, if we make a tikkun on Erev Shavuot. I don't know if this is ever the first time anyone's made a tikkun leil on Erev Shavuot. But if we do, there are unique things that belong to Erev Shavuot that also apply to the tikkun. I'm going to explain what I'm talking about here, and it's all going to come under the heading of the title Torah Text in the Age of Turmoil, which is a fantastic idea that the rabbi gave us uh, for various speakers to uh, think about and teach us to think about and discuss. And when you look at the entire span of Jewish history, uh, you don't have to look far to find turmoil. It's everywhere. And uh, in fact, it is in very relevant uh, to a text that I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes, uh, which is a text for tonight in many, many ways. Because uh, some of you would know that uh, the whole custom of staying up uh, late all night on uh, the night of Shavuot is a relatively recent custom. It goes back to the 16th century. And uh, the great uh, sages and rabbis that were themselves in an age of turmoil in the 16th century, following in the few decades following the Spanish expulsion, and these sages found themselves mostly in the Ottoman Empire, and they started centering on the town of Salonika, which became a real center for the Jewish world. And people like Rav Yosef Karov, Rav Shlomo Alkabet, and others, those who were eventually going to go to the north of Israel to Tzfat and rebuild, the basically almost like a Yavna project, rebuilding the spiritual um, infrastructure and ideas and themes and thought revolutions of the Jewish people going forward into modernity. So they are an amazing example, but that I'm not going to talk about them because I'm just showing that the framework of the Tikkun Lel is really worked out at that point. There is in fact, <laughs> because there's something else going on as well at that time. And that is, and it's also going to create a custom which applies to tonight, a custom for Erev Shavuot. And that is that it has become a custom in the Jewish people, for some people, don't panic if you're not doing this, but for some people, to learn between Pesach and Shavuot, how many days do we have between Pesach and Shavuot, between the second night of Pesach and the night of Shavuot? We have 49 days. So they learn a tractate, a specific tractate of the Talmud that is 49 pages long. And that tractate is Masechet Sota. And so people go, oh, Masechet Sota, the tractate of Sota is 49 pages long. I've got 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot. So there's a custom now to learn a page of Sota a day. Outside one's Dafyomi cycle or whatever one's doing, you learn a page of Sota every day and you finish the whole tractate of Sota. That, that's incredible because that entire minhag, that entire custom that some people are running around talking about can only have happened after the 16th century because while the whole concept of Tikkun Lel is being developed, that very time elsewhere in the world, in Venice, Daniel Bomberg is printing the first ever printed edition of the Talmud. So the idea that Tractate Sota is 49 pages long, because that's how it turned out in the printing, is the source of Sota being 49 pages long, and therefore the custom of saying a page of Sota. But it's also incredible for another reason. It's incredible because if you're going to learn a tractate in advance of Shavuot, the last tractate you would think of learning would be the tractate of Sota, because it is a fascinating and amazing tractate, but it is all about dysfunctional relationships. And in fact, uh, so much so that we know because the rabbis tell us that there is in fact no greater turmoil in the world for a person than the turmoil that happens in their own household. And Sota is a book that looks, is a Masechet, a tractate of Gemara that looks very intensely at the psychological factors behind households, behind marriages, behind relationships. And all of this in advance of Matan Torah, a time when we are preparing to become, in a sense, betrothed to God in the famous mashal, in the famous analogy, and that the Torah given to us in Shavuot is kind of like a, the ring of marriage. It affects a kiddushin. It affects the sanctification of marriage between us and God. 
Therefore, to learn a tractate that is all about dysfunctional relationships and marriages that break apart and suspicions and jealousies and all the sorts of horrible emotions that can come into relationships is quite astonishing. And it's even more astonishing because, <laughs> because, there is another tractate that is also 49 pages long. And that, wait for it, because this is amazing, that is a tractate called the Tractate of Shavuot. <laughs> so, why are we not studying the Tractate of Shavuot? Now, the Tractate of Shavuot, the Tractate of Shavuot is not about the festival of Shavuot. It is the Tractate of Shavuot from the word Shavuot, meaning an oath. But how appropriate would that be? That we study the tractate about oaths and all the implications of making oaths in advance of Shavuot, where we effectively take an oath of betrothal with God that we will study and keep the Torah. It would be an amazing tractate to learn. But we don't, and not only that, the whole play on the name of Shavuot and Shavuot would make a lot of sense if we were to learn that tractate. Jews like word games. That would be very appropriate. 49 pages long, but we don't. We learn Gemara Sota, all about the breakup of horrible relationships. Turmoil. It's almost like we have 49 days of turmoil and suddenly we get the Torah without any preparation of, of learning. Now, the other amazing thing about Sota is that uh, I hold in my hand here a book that's not the Tractate Sota. This book, in fact, is a Tikkun Lel Shavuot because there is an actual text called the Tikkun Lel Shavuot, which is a program that takes you several hours to go through, and you learn little bits of every aspect of Torah. So you learn, go through every parsha of the Torah and learn a few verses from it. It takes you through the Mishnah, like the first and last track, uh, chapter or, or, or Mishnah of every tractate, of all 63 tractates in the Talmud. It takes you into other places, some Zohar, all sorts of interesting texts. So it's nice that we're talking about Sotan, we're talking about 49, and we're on the 49th night doing a Tikkun Lel, because a very, very important Mishnah that appears on the 49th page of Sota is a text that appears in the Tikkun Lel Shavuot. So we can look at this text, and I'm not just going to look at the Mishnah in the next few minutes. I also, uh, to highlight the point I want to make about Torah texts in the time of turmoil, but I'm going to look at the Gemara. There is a Gemara on 49a, so it's precisely now when we would be doing that, because you've got A and B for every Talmudic folio, and I uh, imagine we've only just come into the 49th now, so we'd be looking at 49a, and so that is the text, not just in general, but that is the text for right now. And the Mishnah, the last Mishnah of Tractate Sota, which is on 49a of the Talmudic Tractate of Sota, is all about turmoil. And it's all about historical turmoil. It could pick any period in history up until then to discuss turmoil, but it discusses what for the time period of the Mishnah was the biggest turmoil of all. And that, of course, were the three wars that were fought against the Romans in the first and second century. And the Mishnah names those wars. It says the war against Vespasian, which is 66 to 73. The war against Quietus, who basically that is the war against Trajan's forces in the second revolt of 115 to 117. And then it talks about the uh, war, it, it refers to the Bar Kokhba revolt as the last war, or the final war. And in each of these wars, there were various decrees that were made that limited public expressions of joy or various things that were going on that were perhaps not safe or not wise to do as a result of the changing circumstances within the Jewish people historically. On the one hand, the temple's been destroyed, but also the land has been decimated to a large extent, and many horrible things have happened. In fact, we know, because we've talked about it elsewhere, and um, it's very well known, the absolute devastation that was caused to the intellectual leadership of the Jewish people over those wars, particularly the last one where the leadership was effectively martyred by Hadrian's forces, and hundreds of thousands of people died, and we were exiled from Jerusalem, and they changed the name of the place to Palestine, and everything was disastrous. 
And uh, the Mishnah basically says that uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says uh, in the name of Rabbi Yehoshua who witnessed these events and he says that basically from the time that the temple was destroyed there was just one bad thing happened after another and that's just what's going on. This is a generation by the way that came out of the first turmoil to create Yavna and then went on after the third turmoil to create the Mishnah these are people that believe that these turmoils were not to offset the Jewish people from their ultimate spiritual destiny. But what is fascinating is this. I'm going to read the Gemara. I haven't got it here to put it up in front of you, but I've got it here next to me, and I'm going to read it. We're just going to do a very small passage from the Gemara on Sota 49a on that statement of Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, he says, Mishum Rabbi Yehoshua, in the name of Rabbi Yehoshua, from the time the temple was destroyed, we just got one bad decree after another. Amar Rava. Rava, the famous 3rd, uh, 4th century Amora says, From day to day, every curse that has happened to the Jewish people is greater than the one before. It just keeps getting more and more yuck. And these guys are talking in the 3rd century. They don't even know from medieval persecutions and pogroms and massacres and exiles and banishments. They don't even know from massacres in the early modern period and they certainly don't know from the Holocaust. These guys are just talking up to the 3rd or 4th century. Since the time the temple was destroyed and we lost our autonomy, it's just getting worse and worse. Shenemar, because he brings a pasuk, he brings a verse. And we can we know this not simply because we're living it historically, says Rava, but because the Torah tells us this is what's going to happen. What does the Torah say when it's describing the state of turmoil in the exile of the Jewish people? Baboker tomar mi iten erev. In the morning, you're going to say, who would give the evening? And in the evening, you say, oh, would that it was morning. Whatever circumstance you're going to be in, something else seems better. And in the, in the day, you're going to say, oh, if only it could be night. And at night, you're going to say, oh, if only it could be daytime. <laughs> Rava asked the question, we have that verse, but we need to unpack it a little. Hi, Boker says the Gemara, which morning are you talking about? If you're sitting there at night, and in uh, Laila Ela Galut, but you're sitting there at night, and it's exile, and things are horrible, and you go, would that it was morning, which morning are you talking about? Are you talking about the morning that's coming? If you say you're talking about the morning that's coming tomorrow, who's going to know what that's going to bring? Good chance it'll be even worse. You can't be talking about the morning that's coming. Ela de Khalif. You must be talking about the morning that has been the day before. What you're really saying, because no one knows what your definition of morning is the morning you've just been through. You can't talk about what the next morning will be because you have no idea what it is. Meaning that the morning you're looking for is not some new, great, shiny tomorrow. It's just the morning of yesterday when things were also bad, but they weren't as bad as they are now. That is the definition that Rava gives us of when we're praying for morning. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bleak. And it's very, very tumultuous. Extremely tumultuous, actually, the more you learn of the history of that period. Which is uncannily similar to our own in a number of ways. So then he says, Vela, but if that's the case, if things are just getting worse and worse all the time, Alma Amaika Makayem, what enables the world to endure this? How does the world continue with it to exist when things just get worse and worse all the time? What what mechanism do we have to ensure the endurance and preservation of the world? And uh, you might say, well, that's a bit of an ambitious statement. But the reality is, is that when the Jewish people go into exile, and when they went, we went into exile the first time, and we haven't just been once into exile, very few nations go into exile and never come back. 
Uh, we've been into exile and come back a few times. And we, our exile, the exile of the Jewish people, brings the whole concept of exile into the world. Exile exists because the Jewish people go into exile. So it applies to the whole world. And how does the whole world endure with all this darkness? And the answer is quite surprising. Some of you are going to go, really? But it's very, very interesting. It's two things, says Rafa. And the commentaries are all over. This is this. I'm just reading this Gemara at surface, but you can imagine the commentaries are quite extensive on this. But there's two things that, that really enable the world to endure. One is a Kedusha de Sidra. A Kedusha de Sidra. Now, what is the Kedusha de Sidra? Some gentlemen in this Zoom class and quite a number of women, I would imagine, would be aware that when you go to shul, when you go to pray, we don't, we've, some of us have forgotten what shuls are, but there used to be these things called shuls and uh, they were houses of prayer for people to, uh, to pray in and we would gather and there's this thing called a minyan and a minyan means a quorum of Jewish males of the age of 13. So if they get together, you have special prayers. Anyway, there's a whole order of service. And when you've said the Shema and the Amidah, and you've repeated the Amidah, and you've said Tachanon, and you've read the Torah, and you've done all the things that you do, then you get to the last final part of the service. You say Ashrei again, followed by Uvalet Sion Goel. And there's a whole section there, starting with, And a Redeemer shall come unto Zion. And the rabbis introduced that section there. And that section there is very interesting because we go over the Kiddushah, the very holiest part of the prayer that we had said in the Amidah. And we go over that in Hebrew and in Aramaic. And the rabbis put that there so the Amaratzim would understand it. And I don't need to tell the Amaratzim what Amaratzis is. They know who they are. The Amaratzim get to understand a bit of Torah and everybody that is the people who are not so uh, learned and everybody gets to fulfill their quota of Torah because learning Torah every day learning Torah every day is mandatory and to ensure that the Torah is learned today by everyone they assume that everyone is at least going to shul, even if they're not learning Torah, and that they're at least saying Uvalet Zion. So they sit there and they say Uvalet Zion and they have fulfilled that obligation. Other mystical commentators explain that the Aramaic there is also designed to annul the forces of evil that come into the world. Uh, they're annulled by us saying the Kiddushah in Aramaic for all sorts of mystical reasons. So that's one thing, that section of Uvalet Zion, which enables people without much education to actually fulfill their obligation of saying verses of Torah and understanding them. And the second thing, the Ayahe Shmei Rabad Agadata. It is the response in Kaddish. Those of you who are familiar with the prayer of Kaddish, that we say the major response is Yehe Shmei Rabah. But it's specifically the Yeheshme Rabbah said after the Kaddish, in, during the Kaddish, following a lesson in Agadata. Now Agadata is not particularly the legal parts of the uh, of Torah discourse. Agadata are the legends, stories, midrash, things that shed light on the verses of Torah, but also take us in all sorts of amazing exegetical and interpretive directions. It's all the popular stuff. And sometimes, you know, uh, when, when, when shuls are open, I, I have a habit as scholar in residence of Kofil, at Kofil Shul of giving just 10 minutes of a Gadata between Mincha and Mariv on a Sunday. And what this Gemara is telling me that in fact it is that very act that is causing the world to endure. Not me giving it, but the fact that people are there in the same Kaddish and the Yeheshme Rabbi in the Kaddish. But it also, as the commentaries point out, it also applies to this entire field that we call Parshanut which is the study of the interpretation of Chumash itself, of the Torah itself. Studying the interpretations of Torah in gathered groups and saying Kaddish at the end causes the world to endure. But he doesn't just come up with that idea on his own. He's got a verse to support him. Shene'emar. And this verse, <laughs> this verse, this is an amazing verse. We, we don't have time to go into this verse, but it's a single verse that is bought from an amazing book because he brings a verse from the book of Eov, the book of Job. And... Uh, 
this verse is just so saturated with meaning that it's hard to unpack, but we're going to do it the way the Gemara is looking at this verse. This verse is, Eretz Efata Kumofel, a land that is dark. Efata is an unusual word meaning darkness. It's kind of like, I think, also obviously related to the word Ayef, so that it is the way that darkness falls in that weary way. It's like a weary darkness. Eretz Efata, a land of weary darkness, Kumo Ofel, Ofel, the famous, one of the famous words in the Torah for Afela, the word for darkness, you can't see anything. Obviously, in the book of Job, they're describing hell, but we're talking about now the Gemara is using this to understand the concept of exile and Torah in the exile. Eretz Efata Kumo Ofel, a land weary with darkness, that's like, that's like darkness, Tsalmavet, Velos Darim. It's a shadow of death without orders. Without orders, without Darim, without any discernible structure. And instead of the way the verse finishes, because the verse finishes Tofa Kumo Ofel, where the light is like darkness. In other words, Things that appear, you can't make them out because they're exactly like the darkness around them. Things are there, but you can't make out their appearance. Their appearance is dark. So that which appears is like darkness. The Gemara and Ravas Drush turns this into Tofia Meofel. It will appear from the Meofel, from the darkness. And what is he allowing himself to say that? Because he's using the word Darim. The word Darim from the word Seder. Iniyov, Velos Darim means without order. And Rava says, but if there is order, if there is order, and he's using specifically the word seder, meaning sidra, meaning the parsha of the week. And what he really means by the parsha of the week, he means a regular structured approach to understanding the Torah then tofia meofel, then things, understanding of the Torah, will appear from the darkness. And when he's talking about structured learning of Torah, what he's really referring to are the gatherings of people together to learn Torah together, as was done in Babylonia then and is still done today, that the Torah is divided up into weekly portions and people come together on Shabbat because they have no uh, real time to uh, learn during the week. And they come together on Shabbat and they discuss the parsha, the parsha of the week. And understanding the parsha of the week helps the world endure, is a part of what actually makes the world keep going at a time of tremendous turmoil and darkness. And I guess the takeaway from that is, is that if we are going to engage with Torah as what we do, there's two festivals of Torah in the year, there's Simchat Torah and there's Shavuot, but Shavuot is a very, very serious engagement with receiving the Torah. And if we're going to receive the Torah, and if we're going to allow the Torah to enable us to get the world to endure, to exist at the times of turmoil and darkness, and let's face it, Recently, in recent times, in our own existence, there has been no lack of turmoil for a lot of people, for most of us. But that turmoil is an opportunity. Challenges are always opportunities. So that for us to turn the tofa kumofel, the things that appear like darkness, into tofia meofil in things that suddenly appear and come to light and are comprehensible out of the darkness because we have applied to them a structure and we have applied to them an application of regular learning which really brings us all the way back to where I started beautifully because the idea of learning a page of Talmud a day to cover Masechet Sota which is the custom that has come about that concludes tonight, the night before Shavuot, but is also referred to in the Tikkun, which is appropriately read tomorrow evening, all of those recent customs enable us through regular application, breaking it up into ordered structure every day. I'm not telling you something I don't do myself. 
I don't want to sound preachy, but people really cannot imagine what benefit there is to gain from setting aside a regular amount of time or effort every day to go through uh, the Torah in an organized way. And I would even say, don't set yourself a time, set yourself an amount. So you say, I'm going to do a chapter. Some days will be long, some days will be short. You'll be amazed how much you can go through. Go through Tanakh, Torah, go through Tanakh. You can go through Mishnah, through the whole of the Talmud. But the key is this idea of Sdarim. Our approach to the Torah is not just, ah, here we are, give us the Torah. Our approach is one of engagement. And it is particularly in relation to engagement in groups. And that is why this is such a special occasion, This that we're not only doing a Tikkun Lel on the night before Shavuot, rather than Shavuot, and I know everybody will probably do a, some level of Tikkun Lel tomorrow night on Shavuot, and learn and have a look. Have a look at that last Mishnah in Torah. Realize what our great sages and our ancestors went through. All our ancestors underwent those wars against the Romans and they rebuilt. And realize that that pattern is played out again and again. So that in the 16th century, with all of the turmoil that happened at the end of the 15th, and all the way the Jewish world was completely turned upside down, and people are going, oh my gosh, this is not an exile anymore. This is a permanent state. Exile is when you finish, you go back, and then you know that was an exile. But I don't think there's going to be an end to the exile. And yet a small group of people were gathering in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of that offel, to create a concept such as Tikkun Lel Shavuot, where we skim over the whole Torah, but we look at what we're really looking at when we look at the whole Torah in the Tikkun, is we're looking at its structure. And when you realize how the Jewish people have managed to create a structure of engagement with its primary spiritual heritage and text, then you realize that the power of Shavuot is the power of Torah and the ability to emerge from turmoil. And I'll bring it all the way back to where I started. And that, of course, is with Masechet Sota, that there's nothing more important than Shalom Bayit, I'm about to do a siyum on Masechet Sota, so there's nothing more important than Shalom Bayit. Shalom Bayit is one of those incredible qualities that if you don't have it, you really have nothing, and if you do have it, you basically have everything, and that we know that Shalom is the name of, is one of the names of God, but it's a unique name of God because its presence belongs uniquely in this world. This world is the Bayit, and Shalom is God's name in this world. This is the natural home of that name. And it is our duty to create shalom in the world. If we're not doing that, then the world might endure because we're saying Uval Zion and we are uh, saying Yehoshme in the Kaddish. But we do that because we have this amazing text called the Torah that is labeled to bring light and peace to the world. And that is our primary mode uh, as the Jewish people and why Shavuot is important, why the Tikkun Lel is important and why we can justify learning such a tumultuous tractate in the weeks leading up to Shavuot. I wish everybody a Chag Sameach and uh, I hope that uh, to hear uh, many stories of engagement uh, with Torah uh, from all of you and uh, I'll hand now back to the Rabbi and uh, I wish everyone all the very best and thank you for your good Mazatov wishes as well.